As those skies might suggest, winter is encroaching here in Reykjavik and they are preparing the ships for what will be a long, hard season ahead as the waters out there begin to ice over. And further afield, the thick ice grows ever thicker, as it has done for centuries, for millions of years. And yet, temperatures in the Arctic region are rising faster than anywhere else on the planet. There are those who forecast that within 10 years, we could see ice-free summers here. And that means more open sea than ever before. But of course, how accurate are those predictions really? Well, the World Meteorological Organization is in no doubt. We need far more data to assess the reality of what lies ahead and how best to deal with it. Welcome to the Harper Convention Centre here in Reykjavik for the third annual Arctic Circle Assembly, where we're going to be peering into the future for the region. What will this last great frontier look like come 2020? How great will the changes be? Never mind the challenges, the obstacles, the risks, and of course the opportunities. And how well placed are we to understand now the weather and the climate patterns that are coming our way. In fact, could we forecast today an average forecast, if you like, for the weather in 2050? I'm meteorologist Alex Wallace, and it's time for your weather headlines. The U.S. ambassador to the Arctic was on hand to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the establishment of a U.S. embassy there. The ambassador announced a new agreement between all Arctic nations to establish a 75,000 square mile sanctuary. The area will be protected from commercial traffic and oil exploration. And take a look at this incredible video. 16 people were injured yesterday aboard the Arctic cruise liner Top of the World when a calving iceberg sent ice chunks barreling toward the passengers. One person aboard the ship said that some chunks of ice were bigger than basketballs. Fortunately, most injuries were minor, but one teenage girl remains hospitalized with a serious head injury. And take a look at this, a new autonomous observing network for sea ice monitoring and prediction has been put in place. This Russian-Canadian partnership will double the current amount of observations that were put in place during the year of polar prediction campaign in 2018. Officials say sea ice monitoring will be more precise and forecasts will become more accurate, which should lead to safer passages. Well, for more on the Arctic forecast, let's bring in storm specialist pa Carl Parker. Thank you, Alex. We do have some weather to tell you about across the Arctic Circle right now. There is a low pressure center that is centered right over northern Canada. And along with that, there will be some wind and increased wave action. There's a look at the satellite picture. You see that spin that is west of Baffin Bay there. And taking a look at the winds right now, they're fairly strong and driving out into the ocean north of Alaska. That's where wave heights are going to be two meters or greater high pressure centered over the Barents Sea. As far as the shipping lanes are concerned, they are generally open. Notice that we might have some issues closer to the North Pole as the ice is beginning to expand there. And we'll take a look also at the forecast for next month. We do expect that central shipping lane right across the North Pole is largely going to be closed by that time as the ice expands while the other ones will not. And here is the forecast for Nuke Greenland. Looking at the Norse Festival should be a beautiful day. Lots of sunshine, 18 degrees. Winds out of the east southeast at 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. Back to you. An educated guess for you there. Endless sunny skies, two meter high waves, and of course, hordes of tourists coming to see the next iceberg melting into the sea. How much more information could we have though? Should we have? Well, that's part of the job of our panel to help us look at now. And we have a group of world leading experts from meteorology and Arctic science, from commerce, from insurance and law. But of course, a lot of this is going to depend on politicians. And I'm delighted to say that uh, the president of Iceland, Olafur Ragnar Grimson, is with us to answer some of those questions, Mr. President. Let's start with, we've had a little weather forecast there, a flavor of it. The truth must be, we just don't know what's the world is going to be like in 2050. And it's not the dim distant future, it's just around the corner. 
No, we don't know. And it is a short time. But when I watched this, I was reminded that 10 years ago or so, if you talk to scientists on one hand, and on the other, the people who were probably the most enlightened about the Arctic, the scientists were telling you scenarios that were much more optimistic in terms of how we preserve the ice and the glaciers than is the reality now. So science, 10 years ago, was uh, over-optimistic about what would happen. And if you then talk to the leaders in the Arctic 10 years ago, they would have told you that maybe by the middle of the century, there might be some discussions on sea routes. There might be some discussions on Arctic ports becoming global. So what we have seen happening in the last five years, both in terms of the ice and the warming and the climate, and the commercial interest from countries in Asia and Europe in the Arctic, most enlightened people 10 years ago thought would happen not until the middle of the century. But then what does that tell us? Does that mean that the research is giving us more information or the commercial opportunity is taking the lead? I mean, let's take Iceland for an example. You've got to think about the environment, but of course you're thinking about your commercial future. And there are plenty of people who would be concerned that that perhaps is taking uh, the predominant role. I think the good news about the future of the Arctic is that every country, including mine and including Russia and the United States and China and Japan and Germany and others, have accepted that science and knowledge must take the leadership role in our planning and our execution with respect to the future of the Arctic. I think it is the first time in human history where a big part of the globe has opened up and every government, every country recognizes that the scientists and the research community must first give us a verdict before governments start to act. Is it your concern nonetheless? I mean, we're, here we are, we've got an audience of well-informed Arctic experts. We have a panel uh, of uh, world-leading experts as well. They understand the Arctic, but is it really your feeling that the momentum in terms of interest and readiness to protect the Arctic is rising? Or does it remain pretty low on the, let's say, the, the, the broader political agenda? No, you're absolutely correct. When I first started talking about the Arctic as president more than 15 years ago, it was a peripheral issue. And I often got the question, why on earth are you spending your time and the effort talking about the Arctic? Now it's become kind of mainstream. Now we have seen an undercurrent of interest and that's why the president of France came to this assembly. We are seeing the leaders of China, United States, Russia engaging themselves politically in the Arctic. But let me also correct you, if I may. You referred to people saying they know all about the Arctic. We should acknowledge that we as human race or individual experts do not have a complete knowledge of the Arctic. It is still an uncharted, unresearched, unknown territory to a large extent. And it's very important that we as a human race recognize that big part of the Arctic is still an unknown territory in terms of science, research and economic opportunity. That is the perfect springboard, uh, Mr. President, for our discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very us. much. Uh, thank, thank you for being here. Thank you. Good. Petri, let me start with you. We're talking about information about weather patterns and where we'll be by 2050. How much are we lacking rather than how much do we know? So we know that uh, this uh, global warming takes place faster in the Arctic than uh, elsewhere in the, in the world. And uh, so far we have seen a global warming of the order of one degree and in the Arctic uh, it has ranged from one, two degrees to three degrees, which means two to uh, three times uh, faster than elsewhere in the world. And also we have seen that the ice is melting, especially this multi-year ice is melting in the, in the Arctic and, and, and it has been melting faster than we were able to predict earlier. And, and now we know that by 2050 we should see ice-free Arctic uh, at least part of the year. And, and, uh, and what is our con concern is that, uh, that we don't have a proper safety services to, to, to offer 
for, for those who are operating in the, in the Arctic. We but, have a but yeah, sorry to interrupt, it's not just about um, what we think we know by, say, 2050. I mean, I've seen forecasts, some of which say, in 10 years' time, we will be going through an ice-free summer, potentially. Others saying that won't happen until the end of the year. And that suggests a massive, real knowledge gap. And this, Karen, is where the, I suppose the need for more research comes in, isn't it? It's that simple ignorance as to how all these pieces fit together. Yeah, that's quite right. I think we don't understand a number of processes yet. Uh, like uh, when you fly over the ice, you see in summer lots of melt ponds. You know, there's this little ponds on the ice. And how much energy are they taking up? How much energy is re uh, going into the water underneath and accelerating the melting? These are things which we discover now, that they are spreading all over the place, and uh, our models are not good enough really to capture that. And there are probably other aspects as well which we still need to, to look at. We, train, we have to train our models to really follow the observations more closely, and that's a very big uh, task. Costs money too. Costs money, needs data. We don't have the data really um, throughout the whole year, for instance, in winter, it is uh, really sparse. Uh, the Russians with their ice drift stations, they have delivered really valuable data, but it's a question how they can continue with this. And so in order to actually improve the modeling, the forecasting, um, the question of how can we actually get the right data at the right time of the year, uh, this is a big problem. Michael, obviously, you know, you, your job is insurance and, and managing risk, and you need data to do that, presumably. At the same time, there is a suggestion that, that quite a lot of the activity is going to happen anyway. People have already bought into the idea that the shipping lanes are going to open, uh, the access will be easier. There are big risks involved in that, that thought process. One of the major concerns of the insurance industry were some of the near misses that we've uh, seen um, at the same time as we've seen historical transits through the Northwest Passage, the Nordic Orion um, from uh, Copenhagen went through in September 2013. The Nunavik um, Fed, FedNav's ship went through in September 2014, unassisted, the first unassisted bulk cargo ship in, in, in history. Um, and it was clear that uh, in order to um, uh, regulate and reduce risk that uh, um, a set of rules was needed to be pushed through. We've been involved in finalising the Polar Code, but critical to um, getting the correct um, inputs to determine navigational safety under the Polar Code, where ships have to uh, demonstrate that they are able to deal with the worst case scenario in the conditions that may occur. Tara, do you, is that the way you look at it? I mean, you're, you're in a commercial activity. You're there to make money. Uh, you'll see the opportunities. Uh, you're not going to hang around and wait for more research and more data, presumably, to, to take on your strategy. Looking at that from the purely icebreaking and, and ice management perspective, uh, it is often considered that uh, the uh, warming of the temperatures will make ice melt and things easier. But that's a huge misconcept because uh, it actually changes the conditions. It doesn't make them easier. We have various examples of that already. For instance, in 2012, when we had our icebreakers Fennica and Nordica operating in the Alaskan waters, for the first time ever, there was such a big Arctic storm that a big amount of multi-year ice was distracted from the polar ice cap, and it entered to the operations area, first time ever in August. But on that basis, you, you always have to maintain the highest level, therefore, of safety and precaution, and ideally infrastructure, much of which perhaps isn't even there yet, than start thinking about reducing those levels. Petri? Yeah, if, if you look uh, Arctic from the global perspective, the observing system in the Arctic is really sparse, and, and that, that prevents us to provide the proper safety services for, for those who are operating there with their vessels, and, and if there would be an oil accident in the Arctic, uh, we would be in trouble, and all, if there would be a passenger ship grounded in the Arctic, we, we would really be in trouble because we, don't, we are not able to provide uh, proper safety services to prevent these accidents. And we have to invest in the better observing systems, we have to invest in the satellite systems, and, and we have to also invest in the 
in the in the telecommunication infrastructure to, to deliver these services to the to the users. We need, we need, we need. And we feel that coming <laughs> through at the moment. We'll come back to that in a minute. Karen, you wanted to pick up on that? Well, I think um, one suggestion which may not be too difficult is actually to use ships of opportunity which are going through the Arctic. Uh, may it be uh, cargo ships, a few or tourist ships uh, and equip them with uh, sensors which you can use also for uh, data collection. Uh, that means of course we have to find ways how we can actually install these instruments and keep them running and keep them sort of calibrated but uh, at least it would help a little bit. Um, Tara, you, in a way a lot of this is pointing your direction. Yes. You are the commercial end of, of, of this panel and you are the ones ultimately who could benefit from this sort of work, the research, improved information and data. So come on, put your hand in your pocket and help in terms of investment for that. Before getting my hand to the pocket, uh, I have a response to Karin. So we will have our uh, icebreakers, the Fenica and Nordica, entering the Northwest Passage and uh, uh, just as we speak, and there will be a group of researchers on board. So we're going to have an international researcher team, including Spanish, uh, US, Canadian and Finnish researchers. And this is one example of this possible collaboration where we can do this with no costs since there is a transit operation. So let's invite the researchers to attend the journey and, and, and make their research. Karen, does that hearten you in terms of um, effort made and, and maybe even enhancing a sense of responsibility uh, towards the region? Yes, certainly. I think this is important that we know how to work together. Uh, I think there's one thing. Science doesn't want to be basically helping just certain uh, industries to actually do things we think are dangerous. So in a way we need to remain independent. I think this is a, an issue which is of importance. Science has to remain independent and has to be able to say also these things are no good. But we can come together and uh, it does mean that we, we have to agree how we can work together, how we can um, do our science, provide the data to you by all means, but don't be told what we need to do. I mean, a really good example which Michael introduced me to was Shell in terms of its uh, exploration work around Alaska and providing that information, handing on its information to the Alaskan authorities. But then, of course, commercial interests say, we're not doing this anymore and withdrawing and end of a, a, a potentially fruitful friendship. I mean, uh, exploration in the Arctic is very expensive. Just a single drill costs, uh, I don't know how many hundred millions. If you put this money to actually development uh, renewables, it would be, I think, the better option in the long term. However, this is a decision which is, uh, has to be made on the market. Uh, it can be helped by political decisions, certainly. If you put a price on CO2, it may actually also push uh, the decision more in one or the other direction. The fact is, you do need funds which are consistent and long-term, don't you? And if, if, the, if commercial interests, as Michael was pointing out, can't necessarily provide that, do you have an idea where the funding can come from? Yeah, these, these satellite programs that we have been uh, uh, funding so far, they are based on, on European taxpayers, North American taxpayers, uh, Chinese, Japanese taxpayers' money. And, 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 and that's, uh, you should also keep in mind that uh, what happens in the Arctic has, has global implications. For example, one reason behind these unusual winter uh, weather patterns in the northern hemisphere during the last winters has been the fact that we have seen this melting of the of the arctic ice so it's it's also it, it's it's not only only these 4 million taxpayers who are living in the inside the arctic circle but it's 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 a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's it's a it's an issue that is important uh, important for the for the whole northern hemisphere we're discussing about investments of billions and billions of euros or dollars so do we get really this money from the taxpayers' pocket? No. And uh, for this I consider that uh, international funding mechanisms and definitely public-private partnerships would be the model for the Arctic futures because of the very small amount of taxpayers and the marginal or non-existing infrastructure on a broader scope within the Arctic areas. Do you think that that message is getting home loud enough 
uh, across the globe. I mean, Karen, you, you, you smile, maybe you smirk there. It's not, is it? Not really. <laughs> I think uh, we have to speak up really loud to be heard because there are so many different interests. And uh, I mean, one interest which we should not forget is we're sitting here in the Arctic. Uh, these are all countries which are really well developed. On the other hand, we have, of course, the conflict with the less well-developed countries in the tropics. So, um, but what happens in the Arctic will affect them as well. So in a way, we really need to make sure that uh, everyone understands what happens in the Arctic affects the whole world. Well, the man next to you knows better than anyone. It, it usually takes a disaster, doesn't it, before these sort of measures do improve? Yes, in history, what normally happens is a disaster takes place. Regulation is put together by the world delegations working very hard together. And then, they, then a convention is agreed and then it has to be ratified by a threshold of countries and then that takes years. So incredibly, the world's um, delegations, driven by the responsibility of every Arctic country without exception, have managed to get the Polar Code in place. And we are very lucky to have it. And we are in a very positive space. So we need to make sure that it works to prevent the disaster. We always talk about the safety of shipping. We also have the environment, you know, the, the animals, the beasts which are living there. Because if the ice is melting and if we have more uh, pollution uh, in this region, it will really affect the environment. And uh, we are, in the moment, not really uh, able to predict what was going to happen. So uh, the ice bear is always a you know, kind of nice animal if everyone looks at, but it is affecting much more. The Arctic is not just some um, abstract jurisdiction um, somewhere. It actually is within the ownership for the most part, apart from the central Arctic, of the Arctic states, of which the eight um, Arctic states, or, or probably more specifically the five coastal Arctic states, control their 12-mile territorial limit and they have exclusive rights to their exclusive economic zone up to 200 miles. So what happens in the development of the Arctic is very much also an issue for national legislatures, for the democracy of countries like Iceland, um, the United States, Alaska, and the aspirations of their people, and it's a democratic process, and we mustn't forget that. Well, it's clear there is an ocean of information and data still to be mined from the Arctic. The scope for collaboration and cooperation is there, but it has to start working now, it would seem, if it's to make a difference for the Arctic by 2050. From Reykjavik, from our panel, from our audience, goodbye.